It really is so good to be together to worship. Uh, for those of you that are joining us online, it's great just to lift our voices and our hearts together and worship God. And when we worship God, one of the things, of course, we do is we celebrate who He is and we remember what He's done. Speaking of remembering what God has done, uh, we're going to take just a minute to look back and celebrate what God did uh, just, a, just a couple of months ago at our stadium service as all of our campuses and all of our services came together in one place to worship God and to see Him move. And one of the most profound experiences was seeing so many people particularly young people, take the step of faith to come down and be baptized and declare that they belong to Jesus. So let's look back and celebrate and worship together. You know, I'll never get tired of watching that video. I just love seeing those faces when they come out of the water. It just, it's such a great picture of what God has done, of His grace in action. Those of you who were there, you know what I'm talking about. It, it's the highlight of that service. Anytime you see someone take that step of faith to be baptized and say, declare they belong to Jesus. And I just want to take a minute and talk to those of you who are part of the Chapel Street Church family, in person or online. If you're a regular part of our church family, particularly for those of you who contribute financially to the mission of God here, I just want to say thank Thank you. Maybe you don't always recognize what your gifts and your contributions, uh, the difference that they make, but they're making a huge difference. I hope that little video encourages your heart that God is using your generosity to spread the good news of his gospel, to make an impact in our community and around the world. We're going to be sharing more stories about what he's doing, but for those of you that are regular contributors and givers to the mission of God here, thank you. For those of you that aren't, maybe you pray about considering uh, jumping in. You never know what God can do with a faithful gift. He multiplies our gifts and he uses them for his glory. Let's pray and thank him just now. God, thank you for the way that you bless our lives, for the way that you're so faithful to us, for your great generosity in giving us your son, in whose name we have life and hope and salvation and forgiveness and freedom. And not only that, God, but you call us your sons and daughters into your family and you send us out into the world to make your name known. Thank you for giving us your church to be part of. Thank you for the part we get to play here at Chapel Street Church and for all those who are on mission with their lives and giving of their time, their talents, their treasure. Lord, we thank you. We help us to be generous as you are a generous God to us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to continue in our series uh, in the Gospel of Mark, Following the King. Uh, a number of years ago, my wife and I had the chance to travel to uh, uh, Zambia, Africa, visiting a CURE hospital. CURE is a wonderful organization that's putting first world hospitals in third world countries, and we went to support some of the missionaries to learn what they're doing, uh, and we had an amazing experience. One of the things that happens in this hospital, uh, the relational network of the hospital, is they go out into the slums and the poorer regions and bring food, and they do follow-up visits with people who have had procedures from the hospital. My wife and I got to ride along on one of these visits. Visits. And it was quite an experience. We, we drove through this, the slums of Lusaka, which is a massive city in Zambia. 
And it was, um, I, I don't think I could have ever found the house without help. It, it was just a maze of streets. And I wouldn't call them houses. They were really hovels, part brick, part um, concrete, rubble, um, part tin, and just stone and mud, whatever they could find. And it was this street after street after alleyway after alleyway, this maze of row after row of these little shacks, these ramshackle homes, just countless faces looking out at us as we drove turn after turn. I was completely lost. Finally, we found the place we were looking for, this woman and her children. And we sat and we had a couple of hours, just a beautiful visit. We delivered the food and the medicine and we talked uh, through a translator. We prayed um, and we blessed them. And then we got in the van to drive away. Once again, just weaving our way as the sun was setting through this maze of homes. On the way out, I was struck by the fact that this is one village, one part of a slum, in a massive slum, in a massive city, in a whole country full of cities, towns, and villages just like it, on a continent full of cities and towns and villages full of these slums. And to be honest, driving away from there, I had both gratitude for the experience we had, and I was kind of overwhelmed with the magnitude of the need. There are just so many children, women, men, young, old faces, so many hurting people, so much poverty, and so much need. I, I remember thinking as we were driving away, what, what difference can I, can we really make in the, in the grand scheme of things? Well, that's the central question of the text we're going to be looking at today. What difference can we really make in the world? More importantly, what difference can we make when we give ourselves to Jesus? Perhaps you've had that experience. You've, you've, you've felt, I can't, what can I do? The, the, the needs of, the, of the, my own community, let alone the whole world, are so far beyond my capacity or my ability. I often feel that way. A little background and context for where we are in the story of Mark before we jump into the story. Uh, Jesus, as you'll remember, um, is revealing who he is to his disciples. What's happening in Mark's gospel is he's, he's unfolding his identity, and the disciples are a little slow on the take. They're not always quick to grasp just who he is, and maybe we're like them in some ways. So after he has this string of miraculous events where he, he heals a woman who's tw for 12 years is bleeding, nobody can in help her, he casts out demons from a man, he calms a storm, and he raises a little girl from the dead. Talk about a, like a good string of successful ministry. Jesus, in chapter 6, the first few verses, he heads back to his hometown, to Nazareth. What's your hometown? Where'd you grow up? You ever been back there? My wife and I, we drive through uh, Crystal Lake where we had our first house. We always like to drive by Brook Drive and see the first house we ever owned as a married couple and see. Maybe you like to do the same thing, go back to your roots now and then. Jesus goes back to his hometown in Nazareth. And you'd think, he's just raised a little girl from the dead. Would he be welcomed as a hometown hero? Would he be cheered? Would he be celebrated? That's not at all what happens. In fact, he goes to the synagogue and the people are offended at him. They say, isn't this Joseph's boy? Who does he think he is? They reject him, which is just crazy to me. But sometimes familiarity uh, breeds contempt, meaning we, you, you're too familiar, you think you know, and you can miss what's, what God has for you there. Well, anyway, after that, Jesus sends out his disciples in pairs, in groups of two, to do ministry in his name, to heal, to teach, to preach, to minister to people, and they go out and do this, and they have uh, remarkable experiences, and in verse 30, they're going to come back, and they're going to talk about their experiences, kind of a debrief session with Jesus, but we, we're not there yet, and while they're gone doing the ministry, Mark has this little aside. In the middle of chapter 6, he tells us the story of the death of John the Baptist, Jesus said of John the Baptist that of all those born of women, no one was greater. So you've got John the Baptist, the, the precursor to Jesus, who uh, announced his arrival as the Lamb of God, who Jesus said is the greatest born of women. Herod, Antipas, Herod the Great's son, has him executed. And it's a tragic story, a story of great loss and sorrow. It breaks Jesus' heart. It's, it must have been devastating for the disciples to hear about this. And the apostles come back, the disciples come back. And I don't know why these stories are put like this, if you think about it. Raising a girl from the dead, rejected at your hometown. Sending out your followers to do ministry in your name and they're successful. And your best friend is executed. I, I think part of the point Mark is getting at here is following Jesus as our king doesn't mean your life is always up and to the right. It doesn't mean that it's always victory and success all the time. Yes, there are moments of miraculous and victorious and amazing things, but there are also moments of rejection, 
There are also moments of pain. There are also moments of confusion and loss. The call of the gospel prepares us for persecution more than it does for prosperity. And I don't think as Americans we always get that right. I wonder sometimes if we really understand that, if we grasp what it means to follow this king, what it is we're being prepared for. Disciples, by the way, they're first called apostles in this text we're going to look at. Do you know why? The word apostle comes from the Greek word apostolos. It means the one who is sent, sent out, or sent out. And Jesus sends them out two by two. And they come back and to debrief with him. We too are sent, though. We also are sent ones. We're called to Jesus by his grace, forgiven and, and freed, and then we're sent into the world in his name. Do you see your life that way? Do you think of yourself as one sent by Jesus? Do you, do you think of your life as an extension of Jesus in the world? Is that how you think about your, your day when you get up in the morning? I'm a pastor, and if I'm honest, I don't always think that way. But fundamentally, that's true. The Bible says we are sent ones by the God who's forgiven us, the King who's redeemed us. Okay, let's look at our text, Mark chapter 6, verses 30 through 44. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out, they said, Five and two fish. Then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them and they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up, the 12, bas they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. Now, that's a familiar story, the feeding of the 5,000. I'm going to guess you've heard about it if you haven't heard it before. You know about that. It's one that raises lots of questions uh, and one that has multiple layers of meaning. For those uh, that study the Bible and uh, think the miraculous is impossible and reject miracles, there are lots of crazy interpretations of what this story might have meant or how it was true. I've, I've heard ridiculous things like Jesus wore a flowing robe and his disciples were passing loaves through his sleeves like it was some sort of magic trick to fool the people. But Mark puts it pretty straightforward. Jesus did something that would seem beyond comprehension, feeding 5,000 people from two loaves, five loaves and two fish. So the apostles return to Jesus, and they're talking about all of their experiences, all that they had done. And Jesus' response to them is, hey, let's get away for a while. Come with me to a quieter place and get some rest. I, want, I just want to take a minute there and focus on what we're going to call the king's care. The king's care. Jesus, their king, sees that they need rest. They need to be restored and replenished. And he calls them away with him. They were obviously tired and in need of rest. And Jesus cares for the needs, physical and spiritual, of his people. Do you think about that in your own life? Which is easier for you? To, to serve Jesus or to be served by him? Look at Mark 6.31. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure to even to eat. Think about that for just a minute. So many people, so many needs, coming and going, they didn't even have time to stop and eat. Sound familiar? Overwhelmed by the needs, worn out. Jesus says, let's get some rest. I just want to ask you, do you believe that Jesus wants to take care of you? To care for your needs? He does your spiritual needs, your physical needs. 
Are you more comfortable serving Jesus or being served by him? This is, this is, by the way, this is not quite the same thing in our culture as what we might sometimes hear referred to as self-care, uh, taking a, a self-day or some me time. There's nothing wrong with that, but that's not what's going on here. Jesus is not saying, hey guys, practice self-care. He's calling them to be obedient to him by coming with him to rest and be in his presence. Those of us who are followers of the king, sometimes we make the mistake of thinking that following the king means it's all doing all the time. I've got to accomplish, I've got to do, I've got to drive. Honestly, i got a little bit of that in me. And I think it's important for us to pause right here and notice that in the midst of this miraculous provision for the masses, Jesus is also caring for the needs of the few, his closest followers. Why is this so hard for so many of us? Why do we struggle to be cared for by Jesus? Well, part of the issue is that the, the, the demands are great. In verse 33, they, they, they follow him. The crowd sees where he's going, and they, they, they run along the shore from other towns and villages, and they get there ahead of them. So it's like they literally, physically can't get away from the people and the needs that are surrounding them. And I, I imagine being in the boat with Jesus, right? You're, you're on the boat, you're away from shore, you're trying to go to a desolate place, and from the boat you see on shore the crowds running along the shore to get ahead of you. Like they can see you, and you can see them. I wonder if, <laughs> if they grumbled among themselves. Oh, here they come. We can't escape. But as we're going to see, that's not how Jesus responds. We'll call this the king's compassion. The king's compassion. He does not see the crowd as an interruption to his agenda or even as uh, hindering uh, his, his disciples' need for rest. If I'm honest, that's kind of how I would have thought about it. As the crowd is in my way, the crowd is... Uh, Make, demanding things from me, and I've got, other, I've got another agenda. Let's look at verse 34. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. This word, compassion, is a key word here. We'll talk about that in just a minute. They were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them another key word. Jesus' response to this crowd that's chasing them along the shore is to have compassion. The Greek word uh, that Mark uses for compassion is a compound word. It's fun to say. It's splanknitsomai, uh, and you can try that at home. But it literally means to feel it in your guts, like a, like a gut-level feeling, a, a deep inner uh, movement that you feel deeply. It's the same word he used in Matthew chapter 9 when Jesus looks at the crowds in Jerusalem and says they're harassed and helpless like and he has compassion on them because they're like sheep without a shepherd. Deep compassion. I have a pastor friend uh, when we were just confiding with each other during the COVID season and he said you know, that he felt like he was suffering from compassion fatigue. I can relate to that. Maybe you can too. Just trying to, to muster up some more compassion but I'm worn out. Well, that's not Jesus. Jesus is never too worn out or tired to take care of you or to feel compassion for those that are hurting or those that need something. The reason for his deep compassion, we're told, is the condition of the crowd. They are like sheep without a shepherd. That's a common phrase. That's a phrase full of Old Testament allusions. God is our good shepherd, the shepherd's psalm, and so forth. In Numbers chapter 27, verse 17, Who shall go out and come in before them? Who shall lead them out and bring them in that the Lord's people might not be a sheep without a shepherd? It's God's desire to shepherd his people. Now, the people in Jesus' day had lots of rulers. They had puppet kings, the Herodian dynasty. We've talked about them. They had the Roman uh, occupation leaders and rulers. They had religious rulers, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. They had political rulers, the Sadducees, who were in league with Her the Herodian dynasty. They had teachers, rabbis, and scribes. But Jesus says they didn't have any true good shepherds. They were lacking for people to show them the heart of God the true heart of God, to teach them what the kingdom is really like. And this is serious to Jesus. Jesus looks at the crowd and he sees them as lacking someone to teach them about the heart of God, so to, to love them where they are, and to shepherd them toward God, toward the Father. I remember reading Thomas Traherne. He's a 17th century poet that C.S. Lewis loved, and so that's how I found out about him. Uh, he wrote a book called A Century of Meditation. He's got a hundred meditations and, the, and, and some commentary on them. hundred thoughts about God's view of the world, if, if you will. And uh, the 73rd meditation is, you never enjoy the world aright until you esteem every soul in it as great a treasure as our Savior doth. 
I just like to say the word doth. But <laughs> I think that's beautiful. You don't really live in this world right. You don't really enjoy the world right. You don't really get it until you see people esteem every soul the way Jesus does. That's a lifelong pursuit. Jesus sees this crowd not as compassion fatigue, not as a nuisance, not as a distraction, but like sheep that desperately need a good shepherd. And he is that good shepherd. And notice how he responds to their needs. What's, his, what's the shepherd's reaction to sheep without a shepherd? It is to teach them many things. I think that's interesting that Jesus' response is, I'm going to teach you, I'm going to instruct you in many things. What was he teaching? Well, the gospel, the kingdom, the things of God. Here's the point. I hear, sometimes hear people say things like, well, the last thing we need is another Bible study. We need to take action. I totally disagree. And we might need better Bible studies, but the Word of God is sufficient for the needs of God's people. It is the primary way He feeds us, His Spirit, His presence, and His Word. And He nourishes us through it. He guides us through it. He takes care of us in it. It's not just a, you know, a little book of inspiration or to get a little tidbit here and there. It, 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 is the, it is the thing that meets our deepest needs. Jesus speaking to us through his word. So my point is this. When we say we need to be taught, we need teaching, it's not loyalty to Pastor Jeff's teaching or Pastor Brian's teaching or Sterling's teaching or any of us. It's, it's the word of God, the sufficiency of the scriptures to meet our needs. This brings us to the king's multiplication, the heart of the story, the king's multiplication. Now, the Gospels are really entertaining to read if you read them from the perspective of the disciples who are trying in real time to figure all this out. Uh, if you ever just take when you next time you read through Mark or Matthew or any of the Gospels, just think about what would it have been like trying to put the pieces together in real time and understand what is going on and who is this? Um, they're trying to follow Jesus. They're trying to understand what he's doing and why he's doing it. And Jesus has been teaching now for hours. So he, he sees the crowd. They, they take the boat over to shore. Jesus gets out of the crowd, and he begins to teach these people because he loves them. That's his, an expression of his love and care is to teach them from his, from his, he is the living word of God. So they're hanging on every word, but it's gone on for a long time. The hour is getting late. The disciples see all this, and the people are starting to get restless. They're hungry. You've got probably some, some kids there that are you know, whining and crying, wanting something to eat, and they're, they're far from any town. They're far from their homes. And so the disciples see this, and they come to Jesus with a plan. And in verses 35 and 36, they say, well, um, Jesus, it's getting late. And we really think that we need to uh, send these people away so they can get something to eat because uh, we don't have any food here and we're a long way from any place that we could provide for them. And so the best thing is to send them off and they could buy something to eat. Now, what they suggest to Jesus is really, let, let's, 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 not give, let's not be too harsh on them. They see the need and they're doing the best they can to meet it. They realize, well, we can't meet it. So here's the best plan. Send them away. But it was up to the disciples. This would have been the story of the great miracle of everybody going off to the village and buying dinner. Like that, that's not, probably wouldn't make it in, in the Bible if, it was, if they had their way. Jesus, not surprisingly, has a different idea and a different plan. Let's look at verses 37 to 40. But he, Jesus answered them, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? They're being sarcastic. They don't have that kind of money. 200 denarii, by the way, is about almost two years' wages. And he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out, they said, five and two fish. Then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. Okay, there's a lot in that little passage. Jesus' solution is you feed them. So they want to send them away. Jesus says, no, you feed them. Now, what's really hilarious to me is that here in Mark's account and in John's account, the disciples, they try to explain to Jesus why his idea isn't going to work. <laughs> I mean, it's funny, really, when you think about it. But if I'm honest, I probably would have done the same thing. I just imagine, like, oh, Jesus, you see, well, we, we really would love to do this. I mean, we really would. We would love to do that. But we've... We've done the math. There are 5,000 hungry people. And we've, we've worked it out, and that would be, you know, several years' wages. And we just don't have that kind of cash on us. And so, you know, really, we should send them away. It's, it's, we, we can't do anything for them. Uh, 
let's look at what John's gospel, actually, how he puts it, because Philip and Andrew speak up, and I think it's, it's, even, it's even funnier in John's gospel. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread, that's about two years' wages, would not be enough for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? So, so it, it, this is funny. Philip has calculated the cost. Philip is the math whiz. You know, we, can't, we don't have this kind of money. It would be two years' wages. And Andrew is Captain Obvious. We have five loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many? You know, th like, like Jesus doesn't understand this. Like he doesn't know how many people are there. He doesn't get it. And, you know, the, I was thinking about this as I was praying through the, the text. There's nothing unclear about what Jesus asks them to do. He, he says, you give them something to eat. They don't know how that's going to be possible. They don't understand how they're going to do it. But the instruction isn't vague. It isn't mysterious. It isn't ambiguous. You give them something to eat. They just can't see how it's possible. Here's why. They look at the magnitude of the need, like when I was riding that van in Zambia, and they're overwhelmed. And they think, well, we, we, we don't have the resources, so this can't possibly be our issue. The only solution is to send them away. But that's not how Jesus sees it. Notice, uh, back in, if we go back one slide here, go back one slide. Jesus says, have them sit down in groups of 50 and 100. By the way, that's a weird thing to include. It's an Old Testament reference to how Moses divided up the people of Israel. Jesus is the true and better Moses. There's a lot of Old Testament allusions in here. But this is something I want you to see. And when they, he commanded them to sit them down in groups on the green grass. What does that mean? Why is that detail included. There's not, actually not a lot of green grass in Palestine and Israel in this time of year. Um, this is near the Passover time, so it's springtime. There is some, there is some uh, green grass. He has them sit in groups on the green grass. Why is that included? Well, several scholars think it's an allusion to Psalm 23, that our shepherd makes us lie down in green pastures and restores our soul. Remember what Jesus thought and felt when he saw the crowds? Like sheep without a shepherd. So here's an allusion to the, psalm, the great shepherd, Psalm 23. He's having them sit down on the green grass. He's going to provide for their needs and feed them body and soul in the same way that our shepherd makes us to lie down in green pastures. This is the shepherd caring for his sheep, which brings us to the king's satisfaction. The king's satisfaction. The disciples um, try to explain to Jesus why this can't be done, and Jesus simply asks them the question, well, what do you have? What do you have? How, many, how much do you have? And they're not sure. He says, well, go find out. And then bring what you have to me. I think those two, that, that question and that instruction are all Jesus asks any of us to do. When, when facing the magnitude of the need, all he ever asks you to do is, what do you have? And will you bring it to me? That's it. Well, what do you have? Don't look at the need. Don't look at how, how massive it is. Don't, don't think about what you lack. Just what do you have? and then bring what you have to Jesus. The collected resources amount to five loaves and two fish. Then this is suppo supposed to meet the massive need, right? No, Jesus doesn't say that. He says, bring it to me. Give it to me. L and he, let him do what he will do with it. What do you have and give it to me? So just pause for a minute. I'm asking you, what do you have? What has God given you? What are the resources that you have in your life? And are you willing to give them to Jesus, to bring them to him and say, well, this, this is what I have, Lord. Will you use it? Will you multiply it? What, what talent, what treasure, what resources has God given you? What relationships? And say, God, all, all I have is from you, so I, I, I bring it to you. It's yours. Multiply it. Use it to meet needs that I couldn't possibly imagine. I, I think about people that I've known when I was a youth pastor who served in youth ministry, who were nervous about teaching the Bible to students and being, I don't know if the kids were late to me, and they just showed up and they gave themselves to the Lord and, and poured into these kids. And I, I see now that some of these young men and women that were in those groups are serving God in ways in parts of the country and around the world. And God, Jesus literally has multiplied their little effort as a discipleship group leader, as a retreat leader in that person's life where they're now doing it for hundreds I know some of those people, those young people are pastors now, ministers. They're working and they're missionaries. Bring what you have and let Jesus multiply it. Let's look at Mark chapter 6, verses 41 through 42. 
And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves. This phrase, he looked up to heaven. This should be invoking a memory to those of you who read the Bible frequently. And gave them the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. And they all ate. They all ate and were satisfied. Jesus takes what they bring, blesses it, multiplies it, and there's enough for everyone. Now, I've got lots of questions about how this actually worked. We were in our preaching team meeting this week, uh, and Andrew was uh, imagining, well, when he blessed it in, like, in the loaves, did they like, was it like, a brrr, like just bubbling up out of the baskets, like just exploding all over the place? Like, what did it look like? Well, we're not told how it actually worked. But the point is, in Jesus, all were satisfied. Everyone ate and was satisfied. If you have Jesus, you have enough. Do you believe that? I, I'm, I think we're just conditioned in our, in our culture with everything that you see on social media or on television or on cable news or whatever. There's just, it's, it's a scarcity mindset. There's not going to be enough. It's, we're, we're constantly being bombarded with messages that you need more, you need this, you need that. But the gospel tells us if you have Jesus, you have all you'll ever need. You have more than enough. The whole scene is a foreshadowing of the Last Supper in a way. Jesus himself is going to be given up for all of us. That's what it means when it says that he, he looks up to heaven, he breaks the bread, and he distributes it. The same thing he does at the Last Supper, right before he goes to the cross. He is going to become the sacrifice that's given up for all of us. Let's look at, in John chapter 6, there's a couple of passages. John records a conversation with the disciples in the crowds after the feeding of the 5,000 that's very instructive about its meaning, its deep, deeper meaning. So John chapter 6, excuse me, uh, yeah, John 6, verses 26 and 27. Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Jesus is saying to them, look, you're missing the point. You, 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 want, the, uh, you, just got, you want the bread. You got the bread miracle, and you're like, this is pretty sweet, free bread. We get free bread if we come to Jesus, and they want their, their bellies full, and Jesus says, you're missing the greater point. He goes on in, in verses uh, 32 to 35. Jesus then said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, sir, give us this bread always. They're still not getting it. We, whatever this magic bread is, we want, we want it. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. The, the, whole, the whole story, yes, Jesus provides for our physical needs. God gives us our physical needs. But we also are told man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And Jesus is the living word made flesh. He says, I am the bread of life. This is what I meant when they said there's so many layers to this story. Yes, it's about how Jesus multiplies our efforts to meet the needs of the world. But at a deeper level, it's a story about how the great shepherd is satisfying the desires of our soul by making himself the sacrifice, the one who is the bread of life. That's what the story's about. Imagine being those disciples again, in the boat, watching all of this, scratching their heads, trying to make sense of it, not understanding, only getting a glimpse. In Jesus, there's more than enough for those who come to him. This brings us finally to the king's abundance. The king's abundance. We're, we're told that everyone ate, everyone's satisfied, and not only that, but there are, there's food left over. I think sometimes we think it's a zero-sum game in God's economy. That if I give to this, uh, there won't be enough for that. If I do this, I, this, this won't happen. And like, let's take, for example, the church. I've had conversations with people over the years who have said, we should give more to missions. And I feel like if we don't give this, then we're going to have to, then we'll have to take away some money from some other ministry or program that, that's important as well. My experience is, as people are generous to, to the spreading of the gospel around the world, to mission work, it begets more generosity. And we see, we see the growth of all of it, all of God's kingdom, the body of Christ grows. It's not a zero-sum game. There's more than enough in Jesus to meet the needs of what he's called us to do. We just don't live like that. 
We live like hoarders. We live like, like we're protecting. As a matter of fact, if you think about it, 5,000 people, in fact, actually 5,000 men. So there's at least twice that many people there. It's an overwhelming crowd. And Jesus says, well, what do you have? And all they can find is five loaves and two fish among 10,000 people? Either they didn't look very hard, or some people were holding back. I think the latter is probably more likely. I think some people in that crowd, somebody had a cliff bar or something they were keeping for lunch and said, oh, I'm keeping this for myself. How many of us do that? Yes, yes, I want to contribute, but I've got to, I've got to keep, I've got to make sure I protect my own. Now, this is not a guilt trip to give. I'm simply saying, following the king means looking at our lives and saying, what do I have? And will you bring it to him? And see what only he can do with it. That's the miracle. There's so much symbolism going on here. Just a couple things in case uh, I don't want you to miss this. There are five loaves and two fish. Five plus two is seven. Seven is the biblical number for completion. So it's like the, it's, it's the, complete, it's the complete meal. It's the fullness is provided. And how many baskets are left over? Let's look at this verse, the second to last verse here. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces. 12 is the number for God's people, the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 disciples, the 12 uh, uh, groups of nations around the throne uh, in Revelation. It's the symbol of the full number of God's people, symbolic number. So you have the number of completion, the meal, and the full, no, fullness of God's people. The point is, there is enough in Jesus to meet the needs of God's people. More than enough, actually, because the provision of the kingdom is the king himself. They have more left over than when they started. Did you, did you think about that? Five loaves and two fish. It's not going to go very far. Actually, 12 baskets left over. More than when they started. Only God can do that. Uh, I reached out uh, to Aaron Wise, the director of our Shepherd's Heart Ministry this week. And I said, uh, you know, I'm preaching on the feeding of the 5,000 from Mark. And I just, I know you have stories of God's provision. And if you have one to share, would you share it with me? And she sent me this email. And it's so beautiful. I want to read to you a portion of it. Here's what she says. God is so good to Shepherd's Heart. We serve hundreds of people that come in weekly for food. We have made some great friends, and our favorite part of serving them is building our relationship with them. Last summer, we started making dinner for families that come in to shop every Monday and Thursday evening, all with the goal of being able to sit and eat with our guests and cultivate a relationship. With the numbers fluctuating frequently, our team became nervous, wondering if we would have enough to serve to feed everyone that came for dinner. I marvel at how God provides. We don't take reservations, but we eagerly invite all to come. They come, and he provides. The second dinner we ever hosted last summer, one of the guests who came to me was so thankful and overwhelmed that we were doing this for them. She said, if only I had the resources, I would love to make dinner for everyone. We asked her, well, what specifically would you make? What would your, what would your specialty be? She said, ribs, with a smile. I kind of laughed and thought, well, that's setting the bar a bit high for what we would be serving but not too high for God. Wouldn't you know, the very morning uh, uh, that after she said that, to do that, a huge donation of ribs came into the pantry. Mind you, this is not the kind of thing we typically receive. We were able to supply her with the ribs, and she brought back the most delicious rib dinner I've ever eaten. I don't believe any of us know if there were any loaves or fishes left over, but I can assure you, not one rib was left over. <laughs> I wish I'd have been part of that rib dinner. She goes on, we see this kind of lavish provision from God so often. Chapel Street families can sign up to prepare meals. And she goes on to tell another story where she says that one evening they're having meal and some families brought the meal. There wasn't enough to go around and they're, they're worried people are showing up in droves. And there's not enough food. And right then another family from our church drove up and had their day wrong and brought a full meal saying, oh, we thought our day was today. And it was perfect timing. You know, we, people show up and God provides. These are just two stories of so many stories. I could tell you stories about our time in Zambia, seeing God multiplying the efforts of this little hospital, the resources that he gives these people that are just, all they're doing is saying, I remember meeting uh, uh, the, uh, Dr. Jimmy, who, who's a, a, a well-known surgeon, neurosurgeon in London, and said, God, you've given me these skills and these gifts, and I've made all this money, but I want to give my life to make it a difference in a different way. So I'm giving you myself, my, my skills as a physician. And he sent him to Zambia to the Cure Hospital, and he's, he's there performing surgery on these children who can't get those. He said, there's, there's tons of guys like me in London, in Great Britain, but there aren't that many there. God multiplies our efforts when we bring what we have to him. That's the central message of this miracle. You look out at the needs of the world and you think, well, what difference can I make? The truth is, on your own, not much. 
No difference at all. But you have no idea what Jesus, our King, can do if we just bring what we have to Him and let Him multiply it and meet the needs. Let's pray. God, we thank you and we praise you for this story. It's miraculous. It's, uh, it's incredible. And sometimes we even think it's just beyond uh, comprehension. And it is. But so are you. And you are our King. You are beyond our capacity to understand and to imagine what you can do. And yet, you care for us intimately, personally. You see us and you know when we need to be with you and be alone. And you also see the masses and the crowds. And you have deep compassion. Help us to see the world the way you see every person in it. And God, we can be overwhelmed when we look at those needs. But all you call us to do is to take what we have and offer it to you. And you will do the rest. You did that for all of us. You've done it at the cross. You're doing it even now through the power of your gospel. We thank and praise you in your name, Jesus our King. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Jeff. Uh, something that really encouraged me throughout that sermon was how Jesus he chooses to work through his disciples. He invites them to try to feed the 5,000. He says, you go, go feed them. And they know that that's impossible. That's not something that's realistic. So, but, but Jesus works through their offering, their feeble offering, five loaves, two fish. They offer that to Jesus and Jesus multiplies it. As we go out from here and as we think about our week, Let's look for the, our five loaves and our two fish. What do we have that we can bring to God and ask Him to multiply? Bless you, church. Have a great week.